Greetings YouTubers and welcome back to the Gearbench. In part one of this series we discussed macro nutritional profiles for optimal hiker fuel. Specifically the fat, sugar, complex carb and protein ratios that make for the most efficient pre-hike breakfast as well as for your snacks on the trail. And this was from both weight efficiency and energy efficiency perspectives. I also introduced the food chart where I attempted to list every hiker food imaginable. There are over 900 individual food items listed in 20 categories, all color coded and ranked by calorie density as well as their nutritional content. If you haven't already, I highly recommend you watch part one first as it lays the foundations for everything discussed here in part two. Check below for a link to download the chart. Now I broke the eating done while backpacking into four different events. There was breakfast, trail snacks, recovery, and dinner. In part one covered the first two, breakfast and trail snacks. In part two, it's time to talk about the last two, recovery and dinner. Now, as before, I've done my absolute best to use actual published, peer-reviewed scientific studies to document everything we'll talk about. And I will show you those references as we go, so you can check for yourself or just read further if you're interested. So one of the main takeaways from part one came from this study about where the energy burned during exercise comes from, carbohydrates or fat. And the revelation was that it depends heavily on the intensity of that exercise. At a walking pace, virtually all the energy you expend comes from fat sources. But as you start running at marathon speed, a profound change in your metabolism occurs and a new source of energy appears, muscle glycogen. Now, simplifying for the sake of brevity, there are essentially two metabolic systems available to you as you exercise, aerobic and anaerobic, which translate to processes that occur in the presence of oxygen or without it. So when you're working at low intensity, there's enough oxygen available to use the aerobic system, which utilizes your much more efficient fat stores. And this allows you to go for a very long time without recovery. But as the intensity of your effort increases, the oxygen needed for continued aerobic metabolism is exceeded by what your breathing can supply. And that's when your body starts switching over to its anaerobic backup system, which utilizes the sugar reserves stored directly in your muscles as glycogen. It's survival mechanism stuff. There's high speed fuel stored within the muscle cells themselves for those fight or flight times when your effort outpaces your ability to respirate. And it's a neat option to have, but one that, as you might suspect, has its limitations. For perspective, consider that the average person carries from around 50 to 60,000 calories in adipose tissue, which is your body fat. It's enough to fuel a walking pace for several hundred miles. In contrast, you're only able to store about 1,500 calories in muscle glycogen. And that's the limitation. As you start moving quicker and quicker, the percent of your energy coming from that precious, relatively small reserve of glycogen gets greater and greater, and consequently you'll burn through it faster. What happens when the glycogen is gone? Well, you know it is bonking. It's a well-known hazard amongst runners, sometimes referred to as hitting the wall. It's a wave of fatigue and exhaustion that makes you question whether you can go on. And when it happens, you'll have no choice but to slow your pace back down to where you're only burning fat again. It doesn't just happen to runners. Evidence suggests that hikers can bonk as well. It won't happen as fast, it might be days instead of hours, and the onset won't be as brutal as those marathoners going wobbly and collapsing to the ground just before the finish line. But it's still a concern, and something that could potentially ruin a long distance hike. Now, Obviously the first step in pushing back the wall is eating while you hike. Everybody knows that carbs help fuel a workout, but as discussed in part one of this series, adding some protein to the mix can significantly increase those carbs' ability to prolong your endurance. And that became the basis for the nutritional recommendations of trail snacks, as previously discussed. Follow the link in the description if you haven't seen that video. But, if your hike is hard enough to have you entering that anaerobic zone, even partially because it's not an either-or situation, you can be using your aerobic and anaerobic systems simultaneously, you may not be able to consume enough munchies while on the move to prevent 100% of the glycogen depletion that you'll experience. And that means your wall is out there somewhere waiting. 
It might be days down the trail though, and that introduces the concept of recovery. If you're depleting your glycogen by a certain amount during every hike, eventually you'll run out, unless you can adequately replenish it at the end of each day after your exertions are done. So, what kind of recovery cocktail can we concoct that best replenishes your spent glycogen stores? We go now to our scientists. So researchers put test subjects through glycogen depleting exercise and then fed them one of two recovery drinks, a carbohydrate protein beverage and a traditional carbohydrate electrolyte beverage, probably something like this. Now in subsequent exercise, they found the subjects who had previously recovered on the carb protein drink had a 55% greater time to exhaustion than the ones who recovered using only the traditional sports beverage. And they theorized that the greater endurance in group one was due to a greater rate of muscle glycogen storage with the carb protein beverage. And being good science types, they ran a second experiment to test that. And what they found was significant. When subjects recovered on the carb protein beverage, they experienced 128% greater storage of muscle glycogen. That's a big difference. So when you work hard and drain your muscles of their sugar reserves, just drinking a Gatorade or having a high carb snack doesn't put it all back. In fact, not even half of it. Adding some protein to the mix can more than double the strength of your recovery. In another study published in the Journal of Applied Physiology, nine male subjects cycled until their muscle glycogen stores were depleted. And for recovery, they were given one of three formulas, carbohydrates, protein, or both. The results were that the carb protein mix gave a greater rate of muscle glycogen storage than either the carb or the protein treatments individually. In fact, it was greater than the other two combined. And in another study, they tested even further just to make sure. This time they gave their subjects either a carb protein mix, a carb only solution of the same exact amount of carbs but without the protein so it would necessarily be less calories, or a carb only option that had a higher number of grams carbs such that its total calorie content matched that of the carb protein combo. After four hours of recovery, muscle glycogen was significantly greater for the carb protein treatment than either of the other two, including the high carb option with matching calories. Also, they found no statistically significant difference between the high and low carb only options. In other words, just increasing the size of a snack won't help you restore more glycogen. It's not a question of just eating two sugary bars instead of one. You need that protein. So what is it about a little protein that helps you put sugar in your muscles? Well, when you exercise, it wakes up all kinds of metabolic processes. And one of these is an increase in insulin sensitivity within your muscle cells. Okay, but what does insulin have to do with glycogen replacement? Well, in a word, everything. Insulin not only activates the enzymes responsible for manufacturing glycogen, it also transports sugar into the muscles where it gets converted. In his article entitled Insulin, the Muscle Recovery Mediator, Dr. Robert Portman describes it as a magic bullet that extends endurance, reduces muscle damage, and builds lean body mass. He calls it the body's ultimate recovery mediator. So, after a workout, when your muscle cells are in a heightened state of insulin sensitivity, they're primed for the replenishment of their glycogen stores. A limiting factor, however, would be the availability of insulin itself. And that's where protein comes in. From the previously discussed studies, ingestion of the carb protein beverage resulted in a 92% greater insulin response than the traditional sports beverage. And this suggests that the post-exercise muscle glycogen storage can be enhanced as a result of the interaction of carbohydrate and protein on insulin excretion. Now, obviously it's the carbs that provide the actual sugar, but it's protein that stimulates the insulin that allows that sugar to be converted into glycogen and stored within the muscles most efficiently. But remember that the period of heightened insulin sensitivity is only temporary. And once you stop working out, all those effects start to fade. If you've ever heard of the so-called recovery window, this is what they're talking about. The potential for anabolic activity peaks from 15 to 30 minutes after exercise and starts falling off rapidly thereafter. 
and while the recovery window is still open, consumption of the right combination of carbs and protein can reduce muscle damage, increase muscle glycogen replenishment, and stimulate the repair and rebuilding of muscle protein. But when consumption of nutrition takes place after the recovery window has closed, the benefits are greatly reduced and can even disappear. Right, so now we know that an ideal recovery includes some protein along with all those carbs. But that's still pretty vague. Our goal is to get specific enough with the ingredients to make an actual recipe for an effective drink. Now, first of all, from the various studies, the ratio of carbs to protein should be about 3 or 4 to 1. You'll recall from part 1, that's the same ratio for our optimum trail snacks. It's probably not a coincidence. There will be some key differences, however, in the design of our optimum recovery drink. For trail snacks, we were talking about solid foods, nutrition bars, nut butters, and the like. Also, for both weight efficiency and to match your body's profile of energy use at hiking level intensity, trail snacks should be about two-thirds fat calories. On the trail, we wanted highly efficient ultralight calories with long, steady, sustaining potential. But for a recovery drink, time is a factor. We need ingredients that'll get her done before that window closes. Solids take longer to digest than liquids, so power bars are out and drink mixes are in. And fat slows stomach emptying, which delays access to the nutrients in that meal. So when you're in a hurry, fat's a no-no. And even with just two ingredients to deal with, that still leaves options. What kind of carbs? Complex carbohydrates or sugars? Well, recalling from part one of our discussion of glycemic index, it would seem to make sense, since we're in a hurry during recovery, to use high glycemic carbs because they're the ones that hit you the fastest. Well, since I'm doing my darndest not to assume anything, I looked around for a study that might address this very issue. It takes me a while, but I did find this one. Researchers put cyclists through an exercise trial to deplete their muscle glycogen and then fed them one of two high carbohydrate diets for the next 24 hours. Those on the diet of high glycemic index carbs had significantly higher muscle glycogen content than those on the low GI diet. All right then, assumption confirmed. A recovery snack isn't a whole grain cookie, it's a sugar shot. Now, what about the protein side of the equation? Now, I approached it from a first principles perspective, and that is to say, what would be the core criteria that we want from a recovery protein? I came up with two full utilization, and of course, fast digesting. Now, as far as full utilization goes, I found a study published in the Journal of Sports Science and Medicine entitled Protein, which is best. The authors examined various sources and scored them using four different protein quality rankings. And what you can see is that apart from eggs, whey protein came out on top in all four systems. All of the ranking methods have their limitations, however, and it's the Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score that has been selected by both the US FDA and the World Health Organization as the preferred best method for measuring protein quality. On that scale, there are five options that scored a perfect 1.0. Milk, eggs, casein and whey, which are both milk proteins, and soy. All right, so utilization ends up being a five-way tie for first place. I next looked into the fastest digesting options via research into protein absorption rates. I found this graph at isowaysports.com, which shows whey with the highest absorption rate of any protein in our top five. And it's pretty closely corroborated by an article at newhealthadvisor.org. Unfortunately, neither site properly references their numbers. Now, milk and eggs are whole foods. They don't just contain protein. They've got fats, sugar, cholesterol. Plus, they look to be the slowest digesting options by far. So I focused on the top three, which also happen to be available as lightweight, easy to pack powdered concentrates. But I was still stubbornly looking for qualified scientific references for which one is best. I found this study published in the Journal of the American College of Nutrition on the role of milk versus soy-based protein in support of protein synthesis. Researchers found that whey protein is better able to support muscle protein synthesis than is soy protein. And they also stated that whey and casein are the highest quality proteins, 
though it was acknowledged that they have quite different rates of digestion and absorption. So lastly, I found this study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences regarding slow and fast dietary proteins. They found that not only does whey absorb more quickly than casein, but they also in turn confirmed that quicker is in fact better. The faster whey resulted in a 68% increase in protein synthesis compared to only 31% for the slower casein. So whey is the easy winner. And of all the forms of whey available, isolate is the most concentrated. Now, of course, there are a ton of different whey protein isolates available, and naturally, I had to try to find the fastest one. Optimum Nutrition markets their Platinum Hydro Whey as 100% hydrolyzed whey protein isolate, and they claim that the hydrolyzation process breaks down the larger proteins into smaller pieces, so it digests faster and gets into your system rapidly. Now, it's never not time for a little skepticism, right? So, I found a published study on the differences between regular and hydrolyzed whey. After eight weeks of resistance training, college-age males saw no difference in overall muscle development between the two types. Remarkably, however, hydrolyzed whey did result in a 6% loss in fat mass, which is something, I guess. Remember, though, that we're looking for maximum glycogen replacement, not muscle growth per se. In this particular instance, we're not after the protein for its ability to bulk you up. We want it for its synergistic ability to enhance sugar replenishment in your muscles during a limited recovery window. And we know that faster is better for that specific purpose. So hydroway isolate remains one of my top picks for the protein element of an optimum recovery drink. My other favorite recovery protein takes a somewhat similar approach, but from a different starting place. Frog fuel is a complete protein made from collagen instead of whey. Collagen is the single most abundant protein in the human body. It's in everything from your skin and tendons, ligaments and cartilage, to your hair, bones and teeth. Now what's similar is that they also have a hydrolyzation process to make the protein faster to digest. They use fruit enzymes to essentially pre-digest the collagen into microscopic particles that are almost an order of magnitude smaller than whey isolates. And they also reference a study in which laboratory tests showed frog fuel was 100% digested in under 15 minutes, whereas whey was still 70% undigested by that time. So, if taken promptly, that should be quick enough to get your insulin levels maximized in time to make use of that 15 minute wide peak at the top of the anabolic activity curve after exercise, which is precisely what we're after. And maybe it's getting off topic, but the collagen in frog fuel has also been clinically proven to increase joint mobility in athletes and reduce pain. And in published studies, it doubles the rate of wound healing. It's actually in use by 4,000 hospitals and clinics as a daily supplement in recovery centers and burn wards. Now that I think about it, maybe it's not off topic after all. Beyond just glycogen replacement, the term recovery could apply more broadly to the joint and tendon strains from the daily punishment of long distance hiking. Just food for thought. If there's a downside, it'd be price. Frog fuel is, relatively speaking, expensive. As of this video, you can get a box of 24 packets for $48, and they are 15 grams protein each for a total of 360 grams. The Platinum Hydra Whey comes in a three and a half pound tub for $49.16. Almost the same price, but it contains 40 servings at 30 grams each for a total of 1,200 grams. Honestly, I su suspect that as long as you're using some kind of whey isolate, you'll do okay. And one of the things I like about the hydrolyzed whey is that the finer powder stirs right into cold water with no trouble. Regular powders are prone to clumping, and to get a smooth drink, you'll need something like a shaker bottle, which I'm not taking hiking. Okay, so our recovery cocktail recipe is almost complete. We know we want carbs, specifically in the form of high glycemic sugars, and a fast digesting protein in a ratio between 3 and 4 to 1. There's just one more concept to introduce so we can pick exactly which kinds of sugar to use because metabolically speaking, not all sugars are the same. 
Remember our primary goal with this initial recovery window drink is glycogen replacement. You'll want to eat more an hour after this has digested, but that's the dinner eating event which we'll get to soon. Your body makes glycogen directly from glucose, which is more commonly known as blood sugar. So the most direct route for replenishment would be to simply eat glucose in your recovery mix. You can buy glucose syrup in heavy buckets. It's used in baking to make fondant and gum paste. More practical for our purposes, however, would be to just buy dextrose, which is a dietary name for the powdered form of glucose. They're chemically identical. And I buy mine in bulk. Since dextrose is glucose, it doesn't really have to metabolize, so to speak. It's ready to go as is, and once you've digested it, the glucose can just absorb into your bloodstream via the intestines. And that's perfect as far as the muscles go. You see, so far we've only been talking about muscle glycogen replacement. There is one other glycogen reserve in your body, however, your liver. Now, since muscle glycogen is stored within the muscle cells themselves, it's not available to anything else. Well, some sort of important other things also run on sugar in your body. The brain, for example, has no energy stores of its own and runs exclusively on glycogen except in episodes of extreme starvation. And the heart is the only muscle that doesn't store glycogen. So the fight or flight reserves that power these crucial systems, among many others, are supplied by your liver. Now the calorie requirements are a whole lot lower than for your motor efforts. Consequently, while your muscles store about 1500 grams of glycogen in total, the liver only holds around 120 grams. Still, it gets depleted and needs to be replaced. Well, there's a specific kind of sugar that works best. Fructose needs to be metabolized first before it can be rendered into glycogen. And as it happens, the organ that handles that is your liver. And as this study concludes, drinks with added fructose were twice as effective as glucose in restoring liver glycogen during short-term post-exercise recovery. All right, so we want a mix of dextrose and fructose in our recovery drink. In what ratio? Well, we know your body stores glycogen in your muscles and liver at about 10 to 1 ratio. And I suppose you could just go with that. But all that muscle glycogen is spread out over your whole body. And hiking isn't going to drain your arms or your chest to the same degree it does your legs. So you aren't trying to replenish everything. I figure 75% glucose, 25% fructose gets me safely where I want to be. Partly because the study cited says you want to saturate the uptake system with fructose in order to get the best benefit for your liver, and partly because it's easy to measure. All you do is just mix equal parts of dextrose and sucrose. Wait, what? Now he's talking about sucrose? Yep, it's just table sugar. But the thing about sucrose is, the first step of its metabolization is to break down into equal parts glucose and fructose. So. If you make a mix that is half dextrose, which is glucose, and half sucrose, which is itself half glucose and half fructose, you wind up with the three parts glucose, one part fructose, which neatly makes a 75-25 split. No scales or measuring spoons needed. And that's it. You now have your degree in recovery mixology. So what do I do personally? Well, thank you for asking. My go-to recipe is as follows. A half scoop of the chocolate flavored Platinum Hydro Whey, three tablespoons of dextrose powder, and a packet of Starbucks Via sweetened iced coffee. And that gives me a carb protein ratio of about 3.4 to one, which is right inside our optimum range. Now a quick note about why I use the Starbucks coffee packet. First off, it's sweetened with cane sugar, which is sucrose. And after metabolization, that gets me the fraction of fructose I need for efficient liver glycogen replenishment. Next, I just like the taste of coffee, and it goes well with a chocolate-flavored protein powder. Uh, it makes my recovery drink into kind of a mocha. As far as the caffeine goes, I'm not a coffee drinker in that way. I don't need to have it in the morning or have it throughout the day to stay awake. But in this case, it's not a coincidence. In all of my research, I came across this lone study on caffeine and muscle glycogen resynthesis. Researchers gave exhausted cyclists one of two recovery drinks, a carbohydrate one or one with both carbs and caffeine. 
And what they found was, after recovery, the caffeine group had 66% higher glycogen resynthesis than the carb-only group. Now, that's a big bump. But here's the catch. They gave the subjects a caffeine dose equal to 8 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. For me, that will work out to be over 700 milligrams of caffeine. I'd have to take five of these packets to get that much. No thank you. Unfortunately, they didn't test results for any smaller amounts. So I really couldn't tell you if one Starbucks packet gets me a fifth of the benefit or not. But it tastes good and it definitely doesn't seem to hurt. And that sort of leads me into the topic of testimonials. Testimonials are used to sell nearly everything, but they're what's known as anecdotes, and anecdotes are not evidence. And that being said, you might still be curious what people who have transitioned to carb protein recovery have actually experienced as a result. However, I made it a skeptical point to wait until after discussing all of the scientific proof. Now, this article in Runner's World features Olympic bronze medalist Kara Goucher, who used to feel trashed after a hard workout, and not just spent for the rest of the day, but often still fatigued a day later. Then she got a new coach who tweaked her post-workout recovery shake with a little protein. The results were immediate. Recovery happened so much quicker. My body doesn't feel as beat up. I really notice it the day after a training session. I still feel tired, but I don't have that huge tightness in my body anymore. And from Lisa Dorfman, Director of Sports Nutrition and Performance at the University of Miami and professional triathlete, of all the things I've done in 25 years of racing, eating something with carbs and protein within 30 minutes of training has been the most critical. Well, add me to the list of the converted. In fact, muscle recovery was what got me started on all of this nutrition research in the first place. Six years ago, we moved from an urban neighborhood to a semi-rural one, and suddenly I had seven acres to manage by myself. Heavy landscaping, like digging out stumps or cutting, chopping, and stacking large amounts of wood from trees the wind blows down. And I was wrecked. In a single day, I'd get so sore it would take me three or four days to recover with copious amounts of I and I. But once I started this recovery regimen, it's as Ms. Goucher says, you're still sore, but not destroyed. Now I can put in a brutal day, and I can go right back out and do it again the next, and the next. So after testing it out in the backyard, I found it works just as well for recovering from a long day's hiking. So you're ready for another. Okay, so just in case scooping powders in the do-it-yourself way isn't your thing, I wanted to highlight a few commercial mix options that make it easy to get good recovery without spending a lot of time or trouble. And they're travel friendly too, which can be convenient on the trail. So when shopping for ready-made recovery mixes, just be aware that a large percentage of them seem to be designed for weightlifters, not endurance athletes. In other words, they're for muscle building, not glycogen replacement. Here's a few of the best that I've found for a hiker's kind of workout. Cliff of Cliff Bar fame makes this powder. It's an all-in-one formula. Just add cold water and drink. It has a 3 to 1 carb protein ratio and the top ingredients are exactly what we're looking for. It's glucose, cane syrup, and whey protein isolate in that order. And even says for best results, drink within 30 minutes of finishing activity. Even though they mark it as a protein recovery mix, it's literally tailor-made for glycogen. And by the way, it's 160 calories per serving with a 10 gram dose of protein plus sodium and potassium for electrolyte replacement. Another good ready-made option are these Rebuild Recovery Packets from Tailwind Nutrition. Their primary business is electrolytes, and these packets also come with their full mix of not just sodium and potassium, but calcium and magnesium as well. And for recovery, they have both our dextrose and sucrose in that order. Instead of whey, however, they offer a vegan option, wherein they just use a variety of vegetable sources to make sure all the essential amino acids are represented. In each packet's 245 calories with 11 grams of protein and an almost perfect 4 to 1 ratio. And then there's Mike's Mix. They have specific formulas for endurance recovery, and his product description talks about all the right things. The ingredients and ratios are on point as well. It's 256 calories per serving for 12 grams of protein. Now, I haven't actually tried this one, but after listening to me drone on about this stuff for weeks, 
Mrs. Gear Skeptic, who's a cardio machine, has tried the Melissa's mix. Now, I'm not sure what's female specific about it, but she likes the taste and has had good recovery results from it. You can order on their website or get it from Amazon. Those are my one-step recommendations, but if you're willing to do just a little bit of mix and match, I've got a few more good options for you. Gatorade sells a recovered drink mix, and they just call it a whey protein powder. From the front, you'd never know it was for anything other than muscle building, but flip it over, and the ingredients betray the inclusion of both sugar and dextrose, along with the whey protein concentrate. It's 270 calories with a substantial 20 grams of protein, but the ratio is only two and a quarter to one. It does say in little letters on the back, carbs to help replenish energy stores, but that ratio is low for endurance, being geared more towards strength training. No problem. Just add that Starbucks iced coffee pack. Turn your chocolate shake into a mocha and let the added sugar bring that ratio to an optimum three and a half to one, plus another 100 calories and the caffeine, of course. Or, Try these Tailwind packets. They are Gatorade style, where it's just carbs, both dextrose and sucrose, plus a full suite of the essential electrolytes. Now add your own protein with a frog fuel shot. It's 260 calories and 15 grams of protein for an optimum range ratio of 3.3 to 1. Both the frog fuel and the Tailwind packets are available with or without caffeine to suit every preference. And lastly, there's good old Gatorade with the protein of your choice. You can buy it in bulk and spoon it into your own baggies or get these packets designed for 20 ounces of water. They're 130 calories, they use the good stuff, sugar and dextrose, and they come with Gatorade's signature electrolyte mix. Add a 12 gram packet of Bulletproof's collagen protein for a 2.8 to 1 ratio, which is maybe a touch below optimum, but this ain't rocket science. I suppose you could use one and a third Gatorade packets. That would get you a ratio of 3.75 to 1. Depends on how obsessive you are. And one of the things I like to do on a day hike, or for the first day out on a multi-day trek, is uh, squeeze a frog fuel into one of your standard 32 ounce bottles of Gatorade. Frog fuel has a nice sort of citrusy tart lemon lime flavor that goes almost perfectly with pretty much any flavor of Gatorade they have, although green apple is my favorite. It gives you a spot on 3.8 to 1 ratio, makes for a lightning fast recovery drink, and leaves you with a nice sturdy wide mouth bottle for all your future mixing needs. Plus the shorter bottle format sits low and secure in most packs side pockets. After taking your recovery drink, Try to give yourself an hour to an hour and a half before having dinner, depending on the size of your mix, whether it's from 10 to 15 grams of protein. From experience, you'll start getting hungry by then anyway. Assuming it's now evening after an all-day hike, it's finally time for dinner. Unfortunately, dinner is a lot less complicated. Basically, the core criteria for a good backpacking dinner should include lightweight, so high calorie density, sufficient protein to maximize muscle repair, after all the damage done during the day, and a thermogenic effect to maybe help keep you a bit warmer at night. I'm taking those one at a time, the first one's easy. I've discussed calorie density in detail in two previous videos. The first one I've already mentioned at the start of this video. It covers over 900 different individual food items in 20 categories, including things like meat, bread, cheese, side dishes, as well as dessert item categories like cookies, candy, and pastries. Check the link below to watch that one. And my other calorie density video deals exclusively with the popular trail dinner option of freeze-dried meals. It covers 279 different meals across 9 different brands, all ranked and sorted by their calorie density. That video is also linked below. Additionally, those videos each come with their own downloadable charts that contain all of the data discussed therein. Now for the second of our core criteria, sufficient protein to maximize muscle repair, I found this study published in the Journal of the American Dietetic Association. It found that 30 grams of protein in one meal increased muscle protein synthesis by 50%. It also found that even tripling that amount in one meal produced no further increase in protein synthesis. Remember that the body can only absorb so much protein per hour. 
eat more than that and it won't get absorbed until it's too low in your intestines to be metabolized for any muscle building or repair. It'll still get used for calories though, but recall that from the calorie density videos that protein is heavy compared to fat. It's probably not a huge deal, but technically to eat more protein than your muscles can use is weight inefficient. From a pounds carried perspective, you'd be better off limiting the protein to just what's useful and making the rest of your calories heavier with more fat. I also found this study published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. They tested protein in doses of 0, 5, 10, 20, and 40 grams. And their results were that muscle synthesis increased with the dose of protein up to 20 grams where it reached a plateau. And there was no additional benefit from a 40 gram dose. So somewhere between 20 and 30 grams of protein in one sitting is all your body can use to build or repair your muscles. Now just a quick visual survey of the entree pouches from both Mountain House and Backpacker's Pantry shows that virtually every flavor falls in this range, with some going even higher. You pretty much can't go wrong with a freeze-dried meal, providing you eat the whole pouch, which is usually labeled as two servings, but it's really only typically around 500-600 calories. Now, if you build your dinner from other foodstuffs like tuna packs or salami sticks, just make sure you're not coming in below 20 grams of protein for the entire meal once you put it all together. And bear in mind as you choose your menu that all proteins are not created equal. Browse this chart of protein digestibility corrected amino acid scores to get an idea of the range that exists. It's no surprise that beef, eggs, milk, and chicken are all high quality proteins, but if you're looking for a vegan option, you can actually do just as well with potatoes or soy. Black beans, however, only yield 3 grams of usable complete protein for every 4 served. And take a look at peanuts and rice. They're only worth half. So just be advised if you plan to get much of your protein from rice side dishes or peanut butter. And wheat is even worse if pasta is your thing. And then lastly, there's the concept of a food's thermogenic effect. An obvious issue with sleep on the trail is trying to stay warm enough. Food can help with that. Some energy is required in order to digest the food you eat. It's just processing overhead that ends up getting spent in excess heat. In this study, dietary-induced thermogenesis was found to be 100% greater in a high-protein diet versus a high-carbohydrate diet. And in this one, the protein-rich meal made three times as much heat as a fat-rich one. And lastly, in this meta-analysis of over 20 different scientific studies on dietary-induced thermogenesis, which looked at diets with all kinds of different carb-protein and fat ratios, including some with alcohol, I found this neat graph. It shows a 24-hour period and how your thermogenic output varies over time, and you can see how it spikes after each meal, and it builds throughout the day. And what's interesting for our purposes is how heat output remains elevated for up to eight hours after your last meal. Now, in their example, people had dinner around 6 p.m. and were probably awake for at least a few more hours before going to bed. And that means their heat output bottomed out a few hours before they woke up. If you've ever experienced being the coldest in bed during the hours just before getting up, this is probably part of that. The takeaway for us hikers is this. If you eat dinner right before going to sleep, your thermogenic food glow might just last long enough to get you through the whole night. Now, to be fair and skeptical, I also found this study. In this one, researchers tested the results from two different diets, one with 7% of its calories in protein and the other with 37%. And each meal was 1,000 calories in size. Then, they actually measured the difference in heat production of the subjects in each test group. It's called the Specific Dynamic Action of Food. And what they found was that the low-protein diet burned 103 calories in heat, while the high-protein feed produced an output of 169 calories, so a 66-calorie difference. Now, while one of the previous studies did find a slight rise in body temperature of the participants, these researchers concluded it was not enough to protect you from hypothermia. It's also probably not enough to let you swap out your sleeping bag for a lighter one, but it may serve to keep you marginally more comfortable with your current system. Take it for what it's worth. And that's it for dinner criteria. Try to get a minimum of 20 grams of protein, but don't bother with more than 30. 
Make sure your protein sources are high quality ones or compensate with extra grams. For both weight and energy efficiency, make the rest of your calories rich in fat. And to make the most of thermogenesis while you sleep, eat right before bed. And for your recovery snack, it was try to keep the carb protein ratio between three and four to one. Use a drink mix for a quicker digestion, not solid food. Avoid fat because it slows things down. Make the carbs high glycemic sugars, preferably at least three to one glucose over fructose. And for protein, use either the fast frog fuel hydrolyzed collagen or a whey isolate. And make sure to get it down within 15 to 30 minutes after stopping for the day. Do that after the power breakfast and a day of optimized trail fuel as discussed in part one, and you will have a better hiking experience or your money back. Right. Well, I think we can wrap up this series with just one more episode. We've used almost all of the nutritional information on a standard food label. The only thing we're missing is the sodium and potassium content. So, Stay tuned for part three on electrolytes and hydration. And as always, folks, thanks for watching, and I very much appreciate your time.